Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and tonight we are going to delve into the world of Black Eyed Kids, or BEKs. I know some of you have been asking for this particular topic for a while, and so I am excited to finally bring it to you again. You might have noticed the thumbnail design changed just slightly, and so that will be ongoing for the new year. Just a couple of things before we get started. There is a 30k AMA post up on the community tab. We're coming up on 30,000 subscribers here, and since I have not yet properly celebrated any milestone on this channel, I thought now might be a good time. So I finally like did something about it early enough. So. Uh, there is a tweet that you can reply to that is pinned on my Twitter account, at ReadsRaven, or there is also the community post and you can ask your questions there. Um, appropriate questions, there. <laughs> um, also, uh, there is new stuff in the shop. I have finally integrated Printful, um, which is the printing manufacturer place that I use for uh, mugs and some of the apparel that I had sold in the shop before. Um, before it was super obnoxious because I had to order the stuff and then wait for that to get here and then ship the stuff back out and it was just a whole nightmare. So now that they're print on demand, when you order anything out of the mugs or apparel category right now, it will expand in the future, then you can go ahead and um, get that sent to you directly from Printful. So that will be really awesome and it means I can offer a ton of different designs like some that you'll see in this intro if you haven't already. Um, and yeah, some of the mugs are super fun, so I'll leave a link, there's always a link, um, to my shop, ravenreadshorror.com, down in the description below, and of course Teespring is still available for all of you who prefer Teespring. And I'll be adding a couple of these designs over there, um, but obviously it's a different format, so I can't always offer everything on both platforms, but I do try. That's all I wanted to let you guys know about. There will be an update video coming soon, as I will be away for about a month, so... But don't worry, you guys will still get content, so... Um, I will see you guys in the next one, and for now, you know what time it is. It's time to get comfortable, grab a beverage of choice, get cozy and get ready to take another journey into the night. I'm an atheist, and I have always been skeptical of the paranormal. Aside from being the most disturbing thing I've ever experienced, this encounter has turned my model of reality on its head. I was on the bus with my friend Veronica at around midnight. One of us mentioned that I was headed to the waterfront, she made a joke about how we shouldn't talk about where I was going on the bus because I could get stalked. I laughed and joked about that a little too, but I felt slightly uneasy. This is when I believe the experience began. I remember that there was barely anyone on the bus. I saw four men chatting in front of us. Not that it's important, but for accuracy's sake, two men were talking to each other, and a short distance away, another two men were chatting to each other. At the time that I'm writing this, a few hours after it happened, I don't remember seeing anyone else in the bus. I got off the bus and Veronica walked me to the SkyTrain station. I remember paying for my ticket and calling her as soon as I paid to jokingly complain about the fact that they had raised transit fare by five cents. We chatted for a bit. I went down the stairs to the platform for the SkyTrain to the waterfront, and a girl was sitting about 15 feet away from me. I immediately recognized her from the bus, though thinking back, I can't recall actually seeing her on the bus. I don't know how she got from the bus stop to the SkyTrain station without me seeing her on the way, but I didn't think to question that at this point in the story. From what I can remember, she looked to be about 9 to 15 years old. I know that's quite a range, but keep in mind that it was past midnight and she was alone. She was small and slim, and her hair was cut into a perfect gray bob. It looked more like a shiny, hard gray helmet than hair. If it wasn't a helmet, it must have been a wig. 
I don't remember anything about her facial features or clothing, despite the fact that I only saw her a couple of hours ago, and, at one point in the story, stared at her intently for fifteen minutes. I do remember she had an alternative sense of style, and I think she was wearing either a leather or denim jacket. I stayed about fifteen feet away from the bench she was sitting on. Something about her was disconcerting and made me mildly uncomfortable. When the Sky Train came, instead of walking through the doors of the Sky Train compartment straight in front of her, she walked the 15 feet to get into the same compartment as me. I remember feeling a little weird about it. I didn't look at her while I was on the train at all. This is where it gets really weird. After the Sky Train pulled into the waterfront station, I got off of it to get onto the sea bus. When the Sky Train arrived, the sea bus was leaving in literally 20 seconds, so I ran to catch it. Only one other person was running to catch it with me. When I sat down, that girl with the gray hair was sitting a few rows across from me, staring straight at me. I immediately recognized her. I don't know how the hell she got to the sea bus from the Sky Train station within 20 seconds before me and without me seeing her. As soon as I saw her, I went from relieved that I had made it to the bus to being on the verge of tears. This is the part that makes me want to cry when I think about it. Her eyes were entirely black. Her facial expression was inhumanly blank, like a robot, and she was face staring straight at me. I'm not exaggerating when I say that it wasn't human. It was so wrong and unnatural. I've never seen or experienced anything like that in my life. All of a sudden, its face stretched into the most horrifying, evil smile. It was the most terrifying thing I've ever seen, and I cry every time I think about it. I was trying to hold back tears at this point. How the hell did it get from the Sky Train to the sea bus without me seeing it? The sea bus takes 15 minutes to get to the other side of the water, so I watched this thing, because it wasn't a person for 15 minutes. There's no way I could have hallucinated it being there for 15 minutes straight. It was physically impossible for it to get from the same sky train as me to that bus without me noticing it at all. I may have hallucinated the eyes and the smile, although I still don't think I hallucinated them for 15 solid minutes, but there's no way I could have imagined her sitting there for that whole time. When the sea bus pulled in, I waited to get off of it last, and I didn't see her on my walk home, though I was beyond terrified during the entire walk. The more I try to remember its physical appearance, the hazier it gets. All I really remember is the helmet-like gray hair, pale skin, black eyes, and the blank stare morphing into that disturbing smile. I do remember it was dressed in alternative clothing, too, similar to mine. And what's creepier is that my hair is gray, too. It's almost like it was mimicking my appearance. It totally lacked the thing that makes humans human. It even lacked that spark that makes animals seem alive when you look in their eyes. It was unnatural. I don't know how to best explain it other than that. This is really scary to me because if this was real, what else is real? And why was it following me? What did it want? So, I was sitting in my car after work. I always have a cigarette in the car before driving home, and I usually crack open the window all the way. But as it's the middle of November in the UK at the moment, I only cracked it open ever so slightly. I wasn't paying much attention when this kid who looked to be about 14 to 15, came up to my window and knocked on it. He asked me if he could get a lift to the train station. Now, the train station is only a 10 minute walk, so I said, I'm really sorry mate, but I can't, as I gotta get home. But I told him where he needed to go. This time the kid got more forceful, and said, you have to let me in, I don't know where I'm going. I never saw the kid's face because he had a hood up so I don't know for certain that he was a B.E.K. But I just remember feeling this sense of terror, so I basically just took off. I looked back in my rearview mirror, 
and the kid was just standing there, staring as the car drove away. I have no idea what I encountered. This happened a couple of weeks ago, when myself and two of my partners, who will be referred to as Ken and Will, decided on visiting this 150-year-old graveyard at night. Now, I'm a sensitive, empath, whatever you want to call it. Will and Ken are blocked off energy-wise. The walk in the cemetery was dark and peaceful, at first. We wandered a while and read some stones, and eventually, at a crossroads, Ken noticed something and walked off. He came back and whispered, There's someone over there. I'm gonna go check it out. The moment he walked away again, I felt eyes watching me from everywhere, and an overwhelming sense of primal fear. I froze, Will strained to see what Ken was looking at. About seven or eight minutes later, Ken was back and looking very spooked. He told me that there was a stone-white figure darting through the trees. I was asked if I wanted to leave, and I said no. So we stayed, and we wandered a little more. After a little bit longer, we came across this huge marble mausoleum, the door of which was made of glass, and you could see through it. Getting closer set me off. Everything felt wrong, and the dread was back. There was an extremely prickly feeling all over my skin. Ken touched the door and felt it too. Both Ken and I saw a shadow moving around inside the mausoleum as we stood there, and the moment he touched the door, the shadow disappeared. We ran, eventually finding a place to sit for a moment. I was completely overwhelmed and continued to feel like we were being watched. Ken was really freaking out, getting dizzy and very quiet. He seemed really off, like he'd seen something that I hadn't. I was asked again if I wanted to leave, and this time, I said yes. We left, and the whole walk home, Ken and I felt the dread again that inhuman, primal fear. Once we got home, Will immediately fell asleep on the couch, while Ken and I began to panic. Both of us felt extremely dizzy and weak. And then, knocking. It started softly, only three. As time went on, it got more and more frantic sounding, but not much harder. We couldn't shake the dread for a good 30 minutes or so. When the dread left, we were left completely drained, mentally and physically, and we decided we would go upstairs and attempt to get some sleep. We assured each other that if it was a BEK, we didn't open the door, so we're safe. At some point, while watching TV and trying to calm down, I got overheated, and Ken opened the door to the upstairs patio and turned on the fan. That was another thing we did wrong. Around 3.20 in the morning, Ken woke up and he remembers only being able to move his head around. The door had opened on its own about halfway, and a child who looked about 12 with extremely messy, shortish hair and a face covered by shadows was standing there and staring. He remembers the most intense terror he's ever felt, so much that it physically hurt. He shut his eyes and held them closed until the terror passed and he fell back asleep. The house was already haunted, a different story, but the activity has been kicked up a notch or two. The cat goes nuts because of it. Since then, for both Ken and I, depression and anxiety have become much more intense than they have been in a very long time. I can't sleep at night, and neither can Ken. There's been a constant dull ringing in my ears. Occasionally, dread so bad it hurts will take over Ken for 20 to 30 minutes, and I've been having random pains in various parts of my abdomen. TVs, radios, and lights turn on and off by themselves, and we both constantly feel watched and intense fear. I can't find any sources on how to deal with or get rid of BEKs and their effects. I also practice witchcraft, and nothing that I've done has worked either. Whatever BEKs are, and whatever they want, is having effects on our physical and mental health. I feel so drained. Someone please tell me what to do. So I'll start off by saying that I am 14 years old. I'm from a hilled village in England, 
and recently I have been doing a project on urban legends. The assignment was set to do in class. Most people did Bloody Mary, and I personally did Slenderman. I have experienced many paranormal things throughout my life. I even knew a person who died after what's assumed to be possession. This is a whole new level for me, because it's not just the normal spirits that I encounter every so often. This is something entirely new, a creature that resembles a human, but isn't. Anyway, I'll get back to what my school project is and why it was relevant. There were two students who did black-eyed children. This was cool, and when it came to presenting, I started to feel sick to my stomach. My stomach really started churning. I thought I just had a bug, so I asked to go to the reception and ended up passing out on the way. My mom took me to a doctor to see if there was anything seriously wrong, but the doctor said it might just be a viral infection. It was probably just a coincidence, but I feel like maybe it was something else. Go forward exactly two weeks later. I was walking my dog Marley. I was going through the woods since there's a thin path that leads through to a golf course surrounded by wooded hills. I was walking through there with my dog when suddenly it started to get chilly and a bit windy. A bit of gravel flew in my eye, and that's when I realized that there was someone on the path in a white dress covered in mud. It was a girl, and I noticed as I walked farther that she had really pale skin. I was about three meters away from her, when all of a sudden my dog cowered away. I stopped and tried to calm him, but no matter what I did, he would go no farther. The girl was facing the other way, and it wasn't until I actually went to tap on her shoulder that I realized she was only about twelve. I hesitated, and as I went to tap her, she turned her entire body around in a very shifty movement. She turned her head first, and did the same with the rest of her body, ending with her feet. It gave me shivers, and I stuttered as I spoke. Her eyes were black and looked like marbles. I said, Are you okay? But before I could finish my sentence, she said, Can I touch your dog? It actually would have made me giggle if it wasn't so scary. She was so direct with everything she said. I said no, but she just kept asking. With each of my items, she would ask, Can I touch this? Can I touch that? And finally she said, Can I hold your hand? It took me by surprise, so obviously I said no. This is where it got confusing. She started bawling her eyes out, talking about how she needed to hold my hand. I eventually started running away, and that's when she actually started crawling over to me to try to touch Marley. Marley, at this point, was literally wincing from fear. I looked back behind me and all I saw was this girl on the ground, pulling at her hair. And that's when she disappeared. I looked back a second time and it almost looked like she was literally sinking into the ground. She was just going down. I ran home, and ever since then I haven't experienced anything else. I also haven't been anywhere near the path where I was walking my dog. I had just recently found out about the BEK phenomenon, and I was reminded of this story told to me by my grandfather of an incident that took place sometime in late 1918 or early 1919 near Sandoval, Illinois. He told me that it had been hot the past summer, and the heat lingered for months, so he had all the windows and both doors open on his house, where he was sitting on the porch, reading a book, because it was too stuffy to be inside. He went in to make a snack and get a drink, when he heard a knock. This struck him as very odd, because most people would just call out that knew him, so he figured it was a vagrant looking for a meal or labor. He lived by the train tracks, so sometimes people would come from time to time to ask these things, and I guess it was normal. So he goes to the hall, and two kids are standing in the entranceway, and they call out, May we come in to rest? It's a long way home. So he says they're welcome to sit on the porch, but that it's way too hot inside to be comfortable. He asked if they had come from the rails, and they just said, We need to come in. May we? From what he said, the kids made him feel peculiar, because number one, they wouldn't look directly at him, and number two, 
They were too clean. My grandfather said that riding the trains was dirty. You got grease on you and coal dust, and sometimes you would get cuts on your hands or knees. He lost his leg doing the very thing which kept him out of the war. But these kids, from what he said, were pristine, like they were going to Sunday school. They weren't sweating, and their hair was neat, and it struck him as odd, if they'd walked in open fields in the middle of the heat, that they would be not at all unkempt or disheveled. He asks again if they would like to sit on the porch, and the girl, it was a boy and a girl, but the boy didn't speak, just repeated, may we come in? Then she just kept saying, may we, may we, may we, over and over again, until my grandfather slammed his hand down and said, damn you both, no. The girl stopped speaking, and he said they both just stood quietly, until the girl looked at him eyes black like coal, and said once more, Mister, may we please come in? My grandfather just walked to the kitchen and sat down, not knowing what to do. He said he felt like somebody punched him in the stomach. He said he sat there until his dog came rushing in the house, shaking like a leaf. So at the end he never told anybody, chalking it up to some kind of heat exhaustion. But he said that it troubled him for years. My question is, how far back do stories of BEKs really go? And, from what I read, sometimes they can hypnotize people, so could they do that with a dog to keep the dog from barking a warning? Maybe that's why the dog was so scared. So, a few years ago, I had a run-in with the entities known as the Black-Eyed Children or Black-Eyed Kids. For those of you who don't know, the black-eyed children are beings that roam the night. They knock on doors and try to get into your house. When you get a good look at them, they look like they're from a different time period. And then you see their faces. They have no eyes. Or rather, their eyes are so black they look like they're not even there. Any encounter with them results in the most terrifying night of most people's lives. However, my encounter with them falls just short. For reference, I was 17 when this happened. At the time of writing this, I'm 19, almost 20. I was working at an indoor water park that will be referred to as the Puddle. I was a lifeguard and was the last one heading home late one night. I was soaking wet and freezing, despite it being around 80 degrees out. I got into my car and locked it, pulling out my phone for some music. I read a couple of messages and got distracted. Suddenly there was a tap on my window. I looked up and saw a couple of kids staring at me. I rolled the window down just enough to hear them clearly. Hey, what's up guys? Are you lost? I asked in a polite tone. They didn't really respond. They didn't move at all. Finally, the smaller child spoke. And as he did, my heart dropped. The voice that came out of this child's mouth was deeper than my own. It was so deep that he sounded like Satan himself. We just need a ride home. Could you let us in and take us there? I couldn't move. I was frozen in fear. Come on, mister, just open the door, the kid demanded again, knocking once more. As they were knocking, a car's headlights illuminated their faces. They had voids where their eyes should be. When they saw my look of horror, they grinned and started pounding so hard on my window that I thought it might break. I kept trying to start my car, but it wouldn't. Finally, one of the housekeepers of the hotel that the puddle was built around came out to throw trash away. I heard them walking away and went to warn them about the kids. When I looked up, though, they were gone. Now, this could have been a hallucination brought on by the amount of stress I went through, but it was very, very real for me. Anyway, my car ended up starting, and I made it home in record time. Like I said, not the scariest thing that's ever happened to me, but it's up there. Let's just hope they don't find me again. This happened about a month ago. I was riding my bike back to my house after going to Dunkin' Donuts. A normal day, as I would think. I was going past an entrance into a neighborhood. I was driving relatively slowly, 
due to the fact that I was going up a hill. I saw a girl walking into the neighborhood. Though she looked strange, nothing very different was really apparent. She was pale and had black hair. I kept staring at her just to make sure she wouldn't walk toward me. Something was just so unsettling, even though there was nothing obvious just from looking at her that should make me feel that way. At the second I was about to turn my head, she jerked her head around to face me, and at that moment my heart sank to my feet. Her eyes were pitch black, and her nose was weirdly pointy. She smiled very widely at me, and then started to walk toward me, her smile fading as she got closer. I realized what was happening and basically biked away as fast as I could. I turned my head to make sure she wasn't following me, but all she did was turn back into the neighborhood. Now I use a different route to go to Dunkin' Donuts. The reason? I'm terrified she'll return unexpectedly. At that time, I knew about black-eyed kids. I knew what would happen if she came near me. So, I guess my point is, be careful when biking near neighborhoods. I have started with a new routine, so I bought a bike. Decided that I would go on an 11 p.m. to midnight stroll before heading home to sleep. Suffice to say, I didn't after this. There's a canal system in Glasgow perfect for cycling, so I followed it quite far out, with my light and bell at the ready, in case I crossed paths with someone, although that's probably not likely, given the time of night. I got off my bike at a bench. Behind this bench, there's a brick wall, and behind those bricks were disused railway tracks, decommissioned in the 1950s. My phone started to play up, and the light from my phone seemed a bit weaker than usual. I followed the light across the muddy canal, and to my horror, I saw what looked like a boy and a girl in the small island in the middle. I asked if they were okay, but I didn't get much of a response. I asked again if they needed my help, or if I could call the fire brigade or police or whatever. Just as I said that, my phone died. I now only had the moonlight to go on. Remembering the light from my bike, I turned it on and scanned the area again. There was no one there. Thank God nothing came out of this other than that. I was absolutely shitting myself on the way home. I cycled home and freaked out a bit, turned my phone on, and when I got home, it had 61% battery. So what the hell happened? Nobody believes me, but I guess I don't expect them to. I would like to know what the heck I saw, though. Thank <laughs> you.